This video is intended to discuss some of the underlying principles behind the idea of stoichiometric reaction control and how to cope with uh, reactions that have non-stoichiometric ratios of reagents. So let's begin by asking ourselves a question here. Does it matter whether we add A to B or B to A when we are conducting a reaction in the lab? Uh, in some cases, it really doesn't matter uh, whether we add certain reagents in certain orders, but in other cases, it turns out it can be quite important. And I want to show you an example of where it can become very important uh, as to the order in which we add reagents. So let's start by thinking about a compound which has two equally reactive sites on it. Now, we'll have some other uh, sort of compound which has a single reactive site that will react with our previous reagent. So these two molecules can react with one another to form a new product. And this product has been functionalized once by the addition of our blue reagent to our pink reagent. But there's an additional reactive site on this intermediate. And so if we have another one of these blue singly reactive molecules around, we can anticipate that it will react with our intermediate forming a final product in which there are two reactive sites attached. And it turns out that when we have a situation like this one, it does matter sometimes whether we add the blue to the red or the red to the blue. So let's take a look at an example of where this would uh, potentially apply. Now let's begin just by thinking about what would happen if we were to take equimolar amounts of the two reagents from the previous example and rapidly mix them with one another. So even though these photographs or these pictures have them static, recall that they're in motion at all times. And so there's an opportunity for each of these compounds to bump into and react with anything else in solution. So let's watch our reaction occurring very slowly in time. Initially, we expect to have a few reactions in which we form the singly functionalized product, as I've done with the molecule on the top left in this image. But recall again that these molecules are all moving and mixing relative to one another. So even though it appears distant from any other singly reactive species in that beaker, it's going to have an opportunity to collide with one of them effectively because of mixing. So as time progresses, we see an example in the bottom left where a new unreacted set of reagents forms our singly functionalized product through the first step of the reaction. But we can also see just above it an already functionalized molecule that's picking up a second functional group. And that's using the second step of our reaction. So at this point during the process, we have two competing reaction mechanisms. And the question is, which one is going to win out and how will we know? So if we were to mix our reagents in a one-to-one -one ratio and then allow them to react uh, relatively rapidly and irreversibly, we would expect, based on what we just saw in the previous slide, that we would end up with a mixture like the one presented here, which is a mixture of doubly and singly functionalized products as well as leftover starting materials. So this is not an optimal situation here. Typically in synthesis, we have a single product in mind, and we'd like to maximize the yield of one of those products, whether it be the singly functionalized intermediate or the doubly functionalized final product. So we need to start thinking about how we can potentially control the outcome of this reaction better. It turns out that the ratio of the products which forms in a process like this depends on two basic and important factors. The first of which is the relative rate of each reaction step within the process. So if the first uh, step is extremely rapid but the second is extremely slow, this facilitates capturing of the intermediate. If, however, the second step is, rel is relatively rapid, it is extremely difficult to capture that intermediate product. We're going to assume for the purposes of our discussion that these two rates are essentially equal, and then we'll discuss how to use our second factor, which is the relative amount of reagent used. In the previous example, recall that we used equimolar amounts of the two reagents, and this gave us a mixture of product. If, however, we add a large excess of the singly reactive species, we can expect to form a large excess of our doubly functionalized product with some leftover singly reactive material. On the other hand, if we were to use a relative excess of our doubly reactive species, we would expect to form mostly the product with a single functional group, 
but also at the cost of having a lot of leftover reagent at the end of the reaction because we will have depleted that limiting reagent. So there's a cost and a benefit to each of these processes, and we have to think about that when we design our synthesis. Now let's take a look at a, st at a different strategy. Rather than combining two equimolar aliquots rapidly, we're going to think about mixing one into another very slowly and the effect that it will have on our reaction. In this example, let's assume that I've got a solution of my doubly reactive material in a beaker. And my singly reactive material is contained within the separatory funnel above. If I add my singly reactive material in a dropwise fashion and allow the reaction to occur before adding additional singly reactive species, I can expect that its concentration will be kept very, very low within the reaction mixture at all times. And this means that we're going to favor formation of the singly functionalized product. Notice that I'm adding the blue material at a rate which is slower than that of the reaction. And as a result, its concentration does not increase as I add drop after drop. Now eventually, I build up so much of my singly functionalized intermediate material that I will eventually make some of the doubly functionalized product. But slow and careful addition of my reagent will give me the highest potential yield of the product that I desire. If instead we were to add the doubly reactive species to the singly reactive species, let's take a look at what happens. Here I have a flask containing the blue material to which I'll be adding my pink material. As I add it, there's a large excess of blue, which means that I favor formation of the doubly functionalized material. This means that by the end of the reaction, I expect to have a very large excess of that final product. An addition of more of my reagent simply results in it accumulating in the flask since there's nothing left with which to react. So as you can see, we get a very different ratio of products depending upon our method of addition. So in summary, in these two situations here, I have the same exact reaction mixing molar equivalents of each reagent. However, on the left-hand side, I'll be adding my doubly reactive to the singly reactive, and on the right hand, I'll be adding the singly reactive to the doubly reactive. And we get a different result in each case. Adding of the doubly reactive gives me more formation of the doubly reacted product, whereas adding the singly reactive product slowly, starting material slowly, gives me more of the singly functionalized material. Okay, so why is this important? Well, one relevant example of the basic type of reaction I've shown here is the formation of dibenzalacetone via an aldol condensation. In this case, acetone has two reactive sites because it has two alpha carbons with potentially acidic protons. So we can attach a single benzaldehyde to form benzalacetone, or we can go on and attach a second to form dibenzalacetone. So in this case, we have the same situation that I've shown previously, where either one or two molecules of benzaldehyde can react. And the product that we'd like to obtain will dictate the reaction setup that we will use. 